journal that this webinar is associated with. Uh, the journal is called PDE and Applications. And uh, as you can see here, it's uh, the idea of the journal is to bring together theory, numerics, uh, and applications. And I'll also link a little bit of information about the journal uh, into the chat after the talk starts. Uh, so for the talk, we ask that you remain muted uh, during the talk and you can type questions into the chat. Uh, or you can wait till the end, we'll have a question and answer session and you can unmute yourself. Uh, all right, but more importantly, uh, let me introduce this week's speaker. We're very happy to have Apala Majumdar of University of Strathclyde in Glasgow, UK. Uh, Dr. Majumdar has, is one of the leading experts on uh, pneumatic liquid crystals uh, and has made important contributions both to the theory uh, and applications uh, of that subject. And she's won uh, several awards, including from the British Liquid Crystal Society and the London Mathematical Society. So uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Majumdar, the floor is yours. Can you see my screen? Yes, looks good. Okay, so firstly, I'd like to thank the organizers for the invitation, particularly Stan, so that he's given me most of the um, practical information and I got the invitation from him. So I'm Apala Majumdar. I work as a, as a professor at the University of Strathclyde in Glasgow in Scotland in the United Kingdom. And as Stan said, Stanley Lee said that I primarily work on the mathematics of liquid crystals, pneumatic liquid crystals, and also modeling their applications in, um, in science and technology. So I do not believe that this is a liquid crystal audience. So I will start off by telling you what liquid crystals actually are. So liquid crystals, as the name suggests, these are materials that are somewhere between solids and liquids. So here I have a picture. This is a schematic uh, picture of a, of, the, of a phase transition from a liquid to a solid induced by decreasing the temperature, as you would expect, you freeze the system. But somewhere in between, for certain materials, one would observe intermediate liquid crystalline phases, which are more ordered than a liquid, but less ordered than a solid. So liquid crystals were actually discovered by accident. So uh, they were discovered by an Austrian biochemist called Frederick Reinitzer. So he had a cholesterol sample and he was heating it. And of course, when he was heating, heating the solid sample, he just expected the sample to relax to a clear liquid. But instead, he found an intermediate hazy liquid with rather turbid optical properties. And that was actually the first experimental observation of a cholesteric liquid crystal. So here I've just got a little picture, which isn't mine. It's borrowed from Professor Sir John Ball's lecture notes, 2015, which are online. So I guess I can borrow them. Um, and it's the same, it's just effectively um, conveying the same picture that these are some materials. So MBBA is a very popular liquid crystalline material. It has a solid phase for low temperatures for temperatures less than theta M. It has a liquid phase for temperatures large enough. So theta here is the temperature and somewhere in between for a range of temperatures, you will observe a liquid crystalline phase. So it's a temperature induced phase transition from the solid to the liquid via some intermediate liquid crystalline phases. So as you might expect, there are many different kinds of liquid crystals. So there's the pneumatics, there's the smectics. The smectics are really soap, they're layered structures. So almost all of us have come across a smectic in our daily lives. And then there are cholesterics, which actually Reinitz have observed in an experiment. And then there are many more exotic phases, ferroelectrics, blue phases, TGBs. But I really only work with the simplest kind of liquid crystals, which are pneumatic liquid crystals. So pneumatic liquid crystals, as you can see from this picture, the constituent molecules are typically asymmetric, so typically rod-like. And these rod-like molecules, they tend to flow, they tend to move around freely as they would in a normal liquid. But whilst moving around, they tend to line up along certain locally preferred directions. So they have a degree of long range orientational order. They have some special directions of averaged molecular alignment. And we call these directions pneumatic directors in the literature. Now, what is interesting, I hope will be interesting for many of you, is that this concept of pneumatic long range orientational order is actually quite generic in nature. You see it at the level of the human DNA. 
You see it in the, at the level of elastomers, so sort of macromolecules, you see it in colloids, you see it in large biological systems. We call these active pneumatics. These are typically bacterial suspensions, large suspensions. And there are even people who claim that you see it in the universe. This I, I don't know much about, but there is certainly um, there are certainly papers where there have been some analogies between structures that might have been observed in the universe with disclination lines in pneumatics, which are defects. So anyway, the key word for me, or a key word for, and, and the key word from the perspective of applications is anisotropy. The fact that pneumatics are anisotropic materials with special directions, they are directional materials. And because they have these special directions, they have a direction dependent response to external electric or magnetic fields, to light, to temperature, to mechanical stress. The key word here is a direction dependent response to external stimuli. And because they have these direction dependent responses, this directionality actually manifests in their macroscopic observables. Things that you would actually measure in an experiment like the electric susceptibility or the magnetic susceptibility. So these are macroscopic responses to electric and magnetic fields and the refractive indices, which is really a measure, a response of a material to external light. So that's the key point. The fact that the directionality actually manifests in the physical properties. And consequently, pneumatic liquid crystals for a long period of time, they have been the working material of choice for a range of applications. Notably, most of you will have heard of the multi-billion dollar LCD, the liquid crystal display industry. But of course, they're also actually used in watches in some cases, in sensors and calculators in e-books, but perhaps the largest and the most thriving application area remains LCDs. So a lot of my recent research is actually motivated by multi-stable systems. So these are systems which have multiple stable pneumatic equilibria, so multiple stable states without any external electric or magnetic fields. So you might ask me, well, what's so interesting about these multi-stable systems? Well, if you're, if, you're, if you're an experimentalist of, or if you're somebody who's interested in applications, if you have a multi-stable system, then you have these different stable states without any external stimuli. And these multiple stable states offer multiple modes of functionality. And that's the crucial piece of information here, multiple modes of functionality, which means you have greater control over the, over the performance, over, over the actual system. And a key motivation here comes from bistable LCDs, which are actually an example of a multistable system. So these are LCDs where optically contrasting states, typically the bright state and the dark state, both of them tend to be stable without an external electric field. So they have at least two different optically contrasting states. And the benefit of this is that if there are at least two optically contrasting stable states, then in principle, we could maintain an image with zero power because it is stable. And we would only need power to refresh the screen or to change an image. So we would only need power to switch, but not to maintain individual images. And clearly, if this can be implemented, then you know, we, we will have higher resolution displays with much reduced power consumption, which is clearly very, very lucrative for industry. Now, this isn't just a theoretical concept. So planar bistable LCD, so bistable LCDs are a reality. So they've been reported in many different contexts. And here is a very nice picture from a paper by Sakonos, Davison, Brown, and Mottram in 2000, where they have this particular bistable device. From a mathematician's perspective, it's really a square. But this particular square geometry with certain boundary conditions is actually bistable. It has at least two different stable states. The next popular example, which is actually of commercial relevance, is the zenithally bistable pneumatic device. Again, the idea is the same. You have a geometry, which in this case actually has a bit of microstructure. You have this grating at the bottom, but the idea is always the same. You have at least two different stable optically contrasting states. And this particular example, the ZBD has actually been used in supermarkets with success for labeling purposes. And here you have a reference. So most of the mathematics that I do is within, is within the landau dijen framework. So the landau dijen theory is one of the most powerful continuum theories for 
pneumatic liquid crystals. So it's continuum in the sense that it is macroscopic. It doesn't really delve into the microscopic details of a system, but it was in fact one of the major reasons for awarding Dijen the Nobel Prize for Physics in 1991. So it's a macroscopic theory. And as with many variational theories in material science, the idea is that it describes the state of a pneumatic liquid crystal. So the, so the degree of orientational order of a pneumatic liquid crystal in terms of a macroscopic order parameter, which we call the Q-tensor order parameter. Now, if you're an experimentalist, you would measure the Q-tensor order parameter in terms of the material response to external electric or magnetic fields. But for a mathematician, the Q-tensor order parameter is a symmetric, traceless three by three matrix with five degrees of freedom. And the essential idea is that these five degrees of freedom here, they contain information about both the special directions of the molecular alignment, the, you know, the special directions of molecular alignment, and also the degree of order about these special directions. So the Q-tensor order parameter is a symmetric traceless three by three matrix. So this is a basic result from linear algebra. You can write it down in terms of its eigenvectors, n, m, and p, and the corresponding eigenvalues, lambda one, lambda two, and lambda three. It's a traceless matrix, so sum of the eigenvalues is just zero. But pneumatic phases, they're broadly classified into three main families according to the eigenvalue structure of the Q-tensor. The first case is just the isotropic case, where the Q-tensor has three equal eigenvalues, and it's a traceless matrix. So if it's three equal eigenvalues, then the eigenvalues are actually just zero, and the Q-tensor itself is zero, which means that the pneumatic has really lost all its orientational order and is now isotropic, as in behaving like a normal liquid. The second and, the very, and a very well-studied case is the uniaxial case, where the pneumatic molecules effectively just have a single preferred direction of molecular alignment. There is just one special direction. And then the Q-tensor only has three degrees of freedom as opposed to five, because there's one special direction and with one non-degenerate eigenvalue and the other two eigenvectors, they actually, you actually have a pair of equal non-zero eigenvalues. So there's actually just one non-degenerate eigenvalue and there's one distinguished eigenvector with the non-degenerate eigenvalue. There are only three degrees of freedom in the uniaxial case. And then you have the fully biaxial case where you have three distinct eigenvalues and a primary and a secondary pneumatic director. So the biaxial case actually exploits the full five degrees of freedom, whereas the uniaxial case really only exploits three because there's just one special direction and effectively just one order parameter about this one special direction. The landau dijen theory is a variational theory, so it has an associated free energy. So you can have many different forms of the landau dijen free energy, but I really only work, well, most of the time I work with the simplest kind, where there are no external fields and I have Dirichlet boundary conditions, so there are no surface energies either. And if you look at my formula for the free energy, you will see that there are just two contributions. The first contribution is what we call the bulk potential. So this is just a degree four polynomial in the eigenvalues of the Q tensor. The B and the C, these are just fixed material dependent constants. We don't need to worry about that. And the A is really a rescaled temperature. And if you've worked with these sorts of problems before, you will know that the purpose of the bulk potential is really to drive um, you know, it's quite common in material science is to drive ordering transitions in spatially homogeneous samples as a function of the temperature. So I'll tell you a bit more about that. So it's a nice degree four polynomial in the eigenvalues of the Q tensor. And we can actually compute the critical points of the bulk potential explicitly. It's not a hard calculation. And if we do that, then we can show that all critical points of this particular bulk potential are uniaxial. There are no biaxial critical points. And actually, they're fully determined by this scalar order parameter S, which if you recall, is proportional to the non-degenerate eigenvalue associated with the single preferred direction of a uniaxial material, because that's what it means to be uniaxial. There is just one special eigenvector. And in fact, you can work out the optimal, the minimizing values of S as a function of the temperature. And the key point here is that for high temperatures, the isotropic state is the unique minimizer of this bulk potential. And as we decrease the temperature, the isotropic state actually becomes unstable 
and we get these ordered uniaxial pneumatic states as being bulk energy minimizers. So this just effectively drives the isotropic pneumatic transition as a function of lowering the temperature in spatially homogeneous samples. But of course, life tends to be much more complicated. We usually have, you know, we, we work with confined systems, right? So we have boundary conditions and our systems are inherently spatially inhomogeneous. So we have this crucial contribution coming from the elastic energy density, which penalizes any spatial variations in the Q tensor order parameter which is why it depends on the gradient of Q. So it's typically a convex quadratic function of the gradient of Q. So once you have all these ingredients in place, so this is not my theorem, I think this is Gartland. This was first uh, proven in a paper by, um, by Professor Gartland, who's, um, who works in the States, that if you make certain reasonable assumptions on the elastic energy density, which really just ensures that your energy is coercive, then proving the existence of global energy minimizers on a suitably defined admissible space, which is just W12 for these problems with Dirichlet boundary conditions is actually almost, it's, it's, it's fine, it works because your admissible space is non-empty, your energy density is bounded from below and um, it's convex in the gradient, so you have lower semi-continuity. So this actually follows immediately from the direct methods in the calculus of variations. So what have I what have we done that's actually new? So this was a PDE. Um, this, so the title of the talk is some PDE problems in the landau dijen theory. So I'm actually going to start with work which is quite old, ten years old, and then I'm going to hopefully finish if I have enough time with work that is actually quite new. So I st I roughly started working on the landau dijen theory about 2008. Um, so this was when I was uh, working as a research fellow in the Oxford Center for Nonlinear PDEs. Um, and this was when Professor Sir John Ball was starting up a new small research group um, in liquid crystals. And both of these papers were actually written um, whilst I was working in Ox PDE. So we, we started off with a fairly um, generic problem, which must be very familiar to people who work um, on variational problems in material science. The, the question was simple at least to state. You take a 3D geometry omega, so this is a nice bounded 3D geometry with a smooth boundary, and we want to study minimizers of this landau dijen free energy in a particular asymptotic limit, which is coined in terms of this parameter L. And this parameter L, so everything is, has been rescaled to make it properly dimensionless. And this parameter L is really just the elastic constant L bar. So elastic constant is a material dependent constant divided by some characteristic temperature and R squared, where R is some characteristic geometrical length scale. So it is inversely proportional to a geometrical length scale. And we want to study properties of global minimizers of this landau dijen free energy in the limit L tends to zero. And you could ask me, well, what does this limit actually mean? For all practical purposes, it means a large domain. So this is what we would call the macroscopic limit, relevant for large domains, which is people what people usually see in experiments, right? And then we have a fixed Dirichlet boundary condition QB. And this boundary condition is quite special. It affects the analysis quite strongly. And it is special because it is a minimizer of the bulk potential for low temperatures. And why do I want to work with low temperatures? Because that's where you expect to see pneumatic ordering. And then this is actually within a fairly, I would say, familiar form, um, you know, in the calculus of variations, you know, you can prove that energy minimizers exist. You can even prove that they're actually analytic solutions of the associated Euler Lagrange equations, which I've written down here. They have a very nice structure because your elastic energy is just grad Q squared, the Euler Lagrange equations here. They are a system of five nonlinear elliptic coupled PDEs. The L is effectively this parameter here. The A is the temperature and B and C are fixed constants. And at least for this part of the work, A, B and C are being treated as fixed and we are working in the limit L tends to zero. And for some of you who have, must have worked in Ginzburg-Landau theory, you can actually decompose the Euler-Lagrange equations into what I call a Ginzburg-Landau part and a remainder part. And I call this the Ginzburg-Landau part because, you know, you can heavily use machinery from Ginzburg-Landau theory to understand some properties of the solutions we will shortly see. The next crucial ingredient is the concept of a limiting harmonic map. So this limiting harmonic map is by construction a minimizer of the bulk potential. 
which is why it has constant order parameter. And then it just has this one degree of freedom, which is this N0, which is a unit vector field, which is taking its values in S2. And by definition, we define N0 to be a minimizer of the Dirichlet energy, which I'm sure some of you will have seen, in a suitably defined admissible class compatible with this boundary condition QB. So in fact, some of you will, it's some of you who have worked on harmonic maps will see that N0 is in fact a harmonic map on a 3D domain. And in particular, and which is, and this is why we call Q0 a limiting harmonic map. But of course, Harmonic maps are well-studied objects in the mathematical literature. So in particular, if NB has non-zero topological degree, then you have lots of nice results for harmonic maps. So if NB has non-zero topological degree, then you have celebrated results from Schwein and Uhlenberg and Brazy, Korn and Lieb and many others, where there are explicit proofs that you have at most a finite number of isolated point singularities determined by the degree of the boundary condition, and you actually have results on the profile of an energy minimizer near each point defect as well. Namely, it's what we call the radial hedgehog. And of course, it, the definition of a singularity is quite clear for a harmonic map. You know, it's a point where N0 is not defined. So in that respect, it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's a familiar mathematical territory, but of course that's not quite what we are doing. We want to study global minimizers of this land audition free energy on simply connected nice 3D domains subject to this special Dirichlet boundary condition, which is a minimizer of the bulk potential in this particular asymptotic limit. And we are assuming that this particular boundary condition here, which is characterized by NB, NB has non-zero topological degree because that is going to give us some interesting behavior. The first result is perhaps expected in a strong convergence. So if you take a sequence of Landau Dijon energy minimizers. And then if you work in the limit L tends to zero, you can always find a subsequence which converges strongly to this limiting harmonic map in W12 as L tends to zero. And this actually does, for, I mean, you can adapt Ginsburg Landau machinery um, to, to show this. Then we have a maximum principle. This is perhaps less of, uh, it's technical, but it can be done, but it is a nice explicit maximum principle for all solutions of the Euler Lagrange equations. Then you have the monotonicity lemma. This was um, this required a bit of work, but again, I would say the key ideas were there. It was an application of the Pohujaev identity. And the monotonicity lemma is really looking at energies within three-dimensional balls, so rescale energies within three-dimensional balls. Again, from probably familiar to people who have worked on Ginsburg-Landau theory. And the key, then the key ingredient is this Bochner type inequality, which holds away from the singular set of the limiting harmonic map. Because just to remind you, if NB has non-zero topological degree, then you know for a fact from results in the theory of harmonic map that N0 also has a finite number of isolated point singularities. So it does actually have a singular set. And this Bochner type inequality which is really an inequality for the energy density, it only holds away from the singularities of the limiting harmonic map. And the strongest result, or perhaps the most useful uh, from a practical point of view, is that we actually have uniform convergence of these landau dijon energy minimizers to this limiting harmonic map everywhere away from the singularities of the limiting harmonic map. And why is this useful? that's really telling you that everywhere away from the singularities of the limiting harmonic map, at least for this particular limit, these landau dijon energy minimizers, because there is uniform convergence, they're actually approximately, they're, never, they're approximately uniaxial because you have uniform convergence and they don't actually have any singularities as such. Although you need to be careful about what you mean by a singularity, but at least you know that um, the gradient of these landau dijon energy minimizers is going to be bounded away from the singularities of the limiting harmonic map. Basically, you have a nice approximate description away from the singularities of this of the limiting harmonic map. So this was this the, the, this was the this was the work that was done in roughly 2010. Then around 2017, we started to look at a slightly different aspect of the same problem. Now this limit, the, the first limit that we've talked about, L tends to zero, 
is very similar to the limit of epsilon tends to zero in Ginzburg Landau theory. Um, so, uh, you know, a lot of the machinery, you didn't, I mean, you still have to adapt it and you have to make changes, but it works. So the next part, this was a lot later, it was really looking at a different limit where effectively we had to use some, or at least combine different ideas. And this particular limit we coined as the low temperature limit of the landau dijen theory, which is again a physically relevant limit. So the, this limit L tends to zero is really for big domains, right? But the low temperature limit is also a physically relevant limit because a lot of, lot of the applications or experiments, they are done at low temperatures when the material is deep in the pneumatic phase. So it's a reasonable thing to study. So the essential problem remains the same. You know, you've still got the same landau dijen free energy. You've still got a nice, simply connected 3D domain with a nice boundary. Everything is roughly the same. You've still got your topologically non-trivial uniaxial Dirichlet boundary conditions that are a minimum of the bulk potential. So just to remind you, this is what they look like. It's the here. So this particular boundary condition, it's a minimum of the bulk potential and it is actually uniaxial. Well, it has to be uniaxial because it's a minimum of the bulk potential. So a lot of the key ingredients remain the same. It's just the question that is different. And what can we say about global energy minimizers in the following asymptotic limit, which is coined in terms of this dimensionless parameter T, which if you look at the definition is roughly proportional to the modulus of A multiplied by C divided by B squared. And remember A, B and C are all parameters that you see in your bulk potential. B and C are typically fixed material dependent constants and A is proportional to the rescaled temperature. And I think the, the step forward here is in this particular limit, we can actually zoom into the defect profiles. So if you look at my previous result, the, the, the work in this particular limit, this is, a, this, this is actually a uniform convergence result away from the singular set of the limiting harmonic map. And what is slightly different here is that we're actually going to zoom into what happens near the singular set of a limiting harmonic map. So this is just setting up the problem again, very similar, except that now you will see that I have written the, written the bulk potential. I have tried to decompose it into two separate parts. This will be familiar to many people as the Ginzburg-Landau potential. This is the extra information that is coming from the landau dijen theory, because remember we are studying maps from R3 to R5, because the Q tensor order parameter has five degrees of freedom. And this term here is precisely containing that extra information coming from the extra degrees of freedom. You've still got your nice boundary condition. NB has NB is topologically non-trivial, same admissible space W12. Okay, so what can we say? Existence of global minimizers is immediate for a fixed T. You've still got your nice euler Lagrange equations. You can decompose it into a Ginzburg-Landau part and a part which is actually new, where the new information would come from. And you've still got the definition of a limiting minimizing harmonic map. And this definition here is, again, it's a perfectly uniaxial Q tensor with constant order parameter. It only has two degrees of freedom and the two degrees of freedom come from N zero, which is actually a harmonic map by definition, but because the boundary condition is topologically non-trivial, N zero has a finite number of isolated interior point singularities. So it has a well-defined singular set. So this is our main theorem here. So we're looking at a sequence of global landau dijen energy minimizers now in the limit T tends to infinity subject to this fixed boundary condition. And remember, uh, you st you've still got your limiting harmonic map. You've, so the first result is strong convergence to a limiting harmonic map in W12, this is probably expected. And uniform convergence again, away from the singular set of the limiting harmonic map. This was actually harder than the first case and you will see why. And then, you have some additional information or we have some additional information about what happens near the singular points of the limiting harmonic map. So near every singular point of the limiting harmonic map, we can prove that there is a point of perfect uniaxiality. So beta squared is what we call the biaxiality parameter. When beta squared is zero, that's when you have perfect uniaxiality, which means a pair of equal eigenvalues, non-zero eigenvalues. And when beta squared is one, that's when we have maximal biaxiality, which means there's one vanishing eigenvalue. So we can prove 
that near each singular point of the limiting harmonic map, there is a point of uniaxiality and a point of biaxiality. And another strong result is that we can prove that the norm of the global energy minimizers, it converges uniformly to one everywhere on the domain omega. We did not have this uniform convergence on the entire domain in the, in the limit of vanishing elastic constant. This is a stronger result. And this is actually corroborated by numerics for this particular limit. And the last result is actually a result on the, on the size of the singular regions which are concentrated near the singular points of the limiting harmonic map. They scale as, um, as t to the power minus a quarter. Remember t is the parameter that we're playing with and we're working in the limit t tends to infinity, but t is effectively your rescaled temperature although there can be other interpretations too. Now the uniform convergence, like I've told you, this was harder for this particular limit. And this was because the Bochner inequality was just far more technical. And we had to consider three different cases and we did not have this problem um, in the first case of the vanishing elastic constant. So this was technically, I would say substantially harder, but it was done. And once you have the Bochner inequality, then proving uniform convergence away from the singular set is something that can be done. Then there was this result of uniform convergence of the norm everywhere in omega. This is really a proof by contradiction and follows from a blow up and a blow down analysis near every point of the domain. And then of course you have this result, which is physically relevant and corroborated by numerics that near every singular point of the limiting harmonic map, we have a point of strict uniaxiality and a point of strict maximal biaxiality and a point of strict uniaxiality. So this is part, part four of the theorem. And this actually follows from a topological argument. So namely, if you take a singular point of the limiting harmonic map, and you look at a small ball around this singular point, and you look at the Q tensor on the boundary of this ball, and you know that because there is a singularity inside, it cannot be continuously contracted. Um, because, it, because of the uniform, con it cannot be continuously contracted in the interior. And it is precisely this, this topological barrier, which gives us this point of perfect uniaxiality and a point of maximal biaxiality. Because if these two points were not there inside every single or single ball around these little balls, which surround the singular points of the limiting harmonic map, then actually you would get a continuous contraction in the interior, but this would contradict the fact that you have a singular point of the limiting harmonic map. And this is a topological argument that excludes any continuous contractions. And this exclusion necessarily creates this point of uniaxiality and a point of maximal biaxiality near every singular point of the limiting harmonic map. And that's, and then of course you have this result on the size of defect course. And this again follows from a scaling argument where we have to consider four different cases and we exclude all four cases. And then we're just left with one case where DJ, which is roughly the size of your defect core actually um, scales as T to the power minus a quarter. And this is actually a nice result. It gives you an estimate of the size of your pneumatic defect cores as a function of the temperature. And again, there is some and certainly numerical validation and possibly some experimental validation too. So what was the strength of this, the first two pieces of work? So I actually do have time to finish uh, the talk, which is good. But I guess the strength of this work was we were probably, um, the, I mean, the, these were probably the first rigorous sort of studies for Landau Duchenne energy minimizers in a, in a proper variational framework. But we, we are certainly not the first people to work on these problems. I mean, they're, they're very good studies by Tim Slukin, by uh, Professor Gartland, by you know, various people working on these problems, by Professor Verga, you know, from, from different perspectives. But these were, these were rigorous theorems, and that's very useful. And they did give some, if not new, at least precise information about, well, how do you interpret a pneumatic singularity? So one, one conclusion of this work is you can interpret a pneumatic defect in terms of the singular points of the limiting harmonic map. That's, that's, that's an interpretation. 
you know, it gives us bounds on the number of sets of maximal biaxiality because you know that you must have a point of maximal biaxiality near every singular point of the limiting harmonic map. It gives us some information about the size of the defect cores, which may have been known from other perspectives, but this is a rigorous result that's useful. It also proves the existence of a uniaxial point near every singular point of the limiting harmonic map. And to some extent, it recovers the skeleton of the biaxial torus which has been widely observed in numerical experiments. So, you know, what, what is the typical structure of a nematic defect? And the typical structure of a nematic defect, at least in three dimensions, is generally believed to be something like the biaxial torus. But of course, proving that is non-trivial, but the biaxial torus precisely has these properties. The fact that it has a ring of maximal biaxiality, which is surrounded, uh, uh, I mean, no, it has a ring of perfect uniaxiality, which is this result here, and this ring is surrounded by a torus where you have maximal, where you have biaxiality. So to some extent, although we, are, we haven't recovered the torus structure, but we have recovered this interplay between perfect uniaxiality and biaxiality within singular structures. So I think that, that was um, certainly, and there was certainly some very nice math, about, very interesting mathematics, which, um, which was very enjoyable, at least for me. So moving on to more recent work, so now we're looking at um, not 3D anymore, we're going to be looking at 2D geometries, namely more precisely 2D polygons. Um, and this is more much more recent work published in 2020 in the Siam Journal of Applied Mathematics, where we're trying to study both energy minimizers and non-energy minimizing solutions on 2D polygons. So are, are 2D systems actually relevant? Well, yes, they are, because they're really idealizations of very thin three-dimensional systems. And more recently, with more experimental freedom, people can design micro-pattern surfaces. And if, you, if you're a mathematical modeler, you can model these surfaces with a certain degree of reliability in a two-dimensional framework. And of course, you have 3D printing as well. So 2D studies are, I would say, um, they're useful. Uh, and of course, mathematically, there are, there, there's new mathematics to be done there as well. Now, I've told you repeatedly that the Q tensor order parameter in three, in, the full Q tensor order parameter is a symmetric traceless three by three matrix with five degrees of freedom. But if you work in two dimensions and there's, there's, there is rigorous justification by uh, Golovati and his colleagues, so this can be done proper. And if you want to do it rigorously, you can do this in terms of gamma convergence. But if you are working with an approximately two-dimensional system, then actually you can work with a reduced landau dijon q tensor order parameter, which is just a symmetric traceless two by two matrix with just two degrees of freedom. So if you look at my P here, you see a S and an N, and both of them are actually easy to interpret physically. The N is just the special direction of preferred nematic alignment in the plane of your 2D geometry. It's really a planar planar unit vector, and S is just a scalar order parameter in the plane of your 2D geometries, just measuring how well the molecules are lined up along N. Now, regarding boundary conditions, boundary conditions are very important whenever we study liquid crystals. So we've chosen to work with tangent boundary conditions. We didn't have to, and our methods will work for any boundary conditions but we chose to work with tangent boundary conditions. And what that means is that on your 2D geometry on the boundary, N has to be tangent to the boundary. It has to effectively be parallel to the boundary. And what is really nice about this 2D framework is that we have a very clean interpretation of defects. So a defect is essentially going to be a point or a line or any subset where this tensor P vanishes and we do not have such a simple interpretation in the 3D framework. In fact, in the 3D framework, you can actually exclude isotropic points in certain regimes. But in the 2D framework, it's just a subset, it's a point line where this tensor P vanishes. So you're effectively just studying nodal sets. And of course, what, is, uh, what, what makes life a lot easier is that in this particular reduced framework, the energy, the landau dijon energy just reduces to the famous Ginzburg-Landau energy. And the lambda that you see here is actually a geometrical parameter. So lambda, you can think of lambda as being proportional to, um, 
the size of your 2D domain. The L is an elastic constant, and the Euler Lagrange equations are just the um, Ginzburg Landau PDEs because you've only got two degrees of freedom, P11 and P12. There's just a system of two nonlinear elliptic coupled, well, it's not just, but it's a system of two nonlinear elliptic coupled PDEs. It's a hard problem, but there can be more can be done here. So the, we, we've worked in two different asymptotic limits. The first limit is lambda tends to zero when we have nanoscale. So lambda tends to zero is really small geometries. And in this limit, we can actually solve the limiting problem exactly because you're just solving the Laplace's problem. And in this case, we were looking at polygons on a 2D polygon with a prescribed Dirichlet boundary condition. This is something that can be done. Um, and we have done it. It's, you, know, you can use the squares crystal mapping. You can, reduce, you can use the symmetries of the polygon and you can solve this problem more or less explicitly using squash crystal mappings. But the important result is that you can track the, the defect sets and we can prove that at least in this particular limit, every regular polygon except for the square will have a unique solution, a unique limiting profile. And this unique profile will have a single isolated point defect at the center of the polygon, except for a square where we have what we call the well order reconstruction solution, which has this pair of defect lines along the square diagonals. And that's the physical implication. And this is interesting because it gives us an explicit control on both the profile and its defect set. But then of course you have the analogous question of what happens as lambda becomes very big. And of course, as lambda becomes very big, we are not going to get these interior defects anymore. In fact, you're going to have almost constant ordering in the interior. Again, this is expected from Ginzburg Landau and the profile, the N infinity, which is the planar vector is fully described by an angle, which in turn is just a solution of the Laplace's equation subject to boundary conditions, prescribed boundary conditions, because we have a prescribed Dirichlet condition. And again, we can use some topological arguments and we can show that at least in the simplest case, if you have a K regular polygon with K edges, then we will have at least K choose two stable states in the lambda tends to infinity limit. So you will have a truly multi-stable two-dimensional system, at least in this limit. So here I have a hexagon, K is equal to six, six choose two is 15. And for large enough hexagons, we will get at least 15 different stable states, but of course they are related by symmetry. They're actually just three different classes. There's the para class, the meta class, and the ortho class. You can ask me where, where these different classes actually coming from. They're actually distinguished by, um, by the profile, by the director profile, by the, by this, by the profile of N. So you have an N here, the N infinity. They're distinguished by the profile of N infinity near the vertices of the polygon. So the, for example, if you look at para, you will see that there is always a pair of diagonally opposite vertices. And these diagonally opposite vertices, these are what we call splay vertices. And this is where your N infinity has a radial profile. So they're effectively distinguished by the profiles of n infinity near vertices. And the para one, which is the, which we believe is the energy minimizer, and basically has a pair of diagonally opposite splay vertices. Whereas for the meta, you still have these two diagonally, you still have these two splay vertices, but they're not diagonally opposite. They're separated by a vertex. And for the ortho, the two splay vertices, they're connected by an edge. So it's really where you put the splay vertices um, that determines the symmetry class of the energy minimizer you're working with. But it's still interesting. You still have at least three different classes. And then we can compute bifurcation diagrams by varying lambda, which is the edge length of the hexagon. So for lambda small enough, we have this unique ring solution, which I talked about with this one central isolated point defect at the center of the hexagon. And for lambda large enough, you know, you have these 15 different solution branches, the para, meta, and ortho. And of course, what happens in between is, um, is very interesting and actually also very relevant if, you, if we want to study applications, because they actually govern, they actually um, they control the transition pathways. So that actually brings me more or less to the end of my talk. So here I have some 
recent references on for, for recent work. So the, the first one I've briefly talked about, pneumatic equilibrium 2D polygons, but we've also looked at the effects of geometrical asymmetry because a 2D regular polygon is very symmetric. You know, so what happens if you break the symmetry of the geometry? What happens if you work with slightly more, uh, you know, slightly more anisotropic elastic energy densities? Because the elastic energy density that I've worked with, so um, at least the one that I've talked about, is just the Dirichlet um, energy density. It's just grad p squared. And this is very well studied. Uh, so what happens if we introduce additional terms to the elastic energy density, which are actually physically relevant, and we have results to this effect, and then work on non-energy minimizing solutions in the 2D framework. So saddle points of the landau Dijon free energy. What can be said about the saddle points and the transition pathways on these 2D polygons with, for example, the hexagon as a prototype example, and this work has now been published. So I'd like to thank everybody who has funded my research. There's the University of Strathclyde, there's the new professor fund there uh, for new for, for new for, for new for new appoint for for new appointments at that particular level. And then there's various funding bodies. Um, so there's the Royal Society, there's the DST UKIRI, and then I've been funded by other people in the past. Um, and then there's the Leverhulme Trust, who are, who are also funding me as, as we speak. And, and thank you for your attention. So, and thank you for the invitation and for your attention. Thank you. All right. Uh, uh, let's thank the speaker for that very interesting talk. Uh, and uh, also, let's open the floor for questions. So one question that came to mind for me was, um, is there any hope of, uh, it seemed like things simplify a lot uh, just for dimensional reasons in particular in two dimensions. Uh, is there any hope of looking at three-dimensional polyhedra and trying to get this same nice uh, list of uh, sort of states? For a cube, certainly, yes, I think. I actually worked on a cube uh, when I was a PhD student. I didn't have all these um, technical, I mean, I was working in a simpler framework, what we call the Olsen Frank theory. But we did a lot of work on the cube. And I strongly suspect that some of that work will carry over, uh, you know, even in the Landau Dijon framework in a 3D frame, in a 3D setting. So, certainly for a cube, almost certainly, yes. And I, I think that we probably know what the classes are. It's a question of proving. Thanks. And then, of course, once we get a grip on the cube, I imagine we'll be able to do you know, things with other 3D geometries with certain special symmetries. Other questions? All right. Well, if not, let's thank Apala again. Thank you. And uh, uh, yes, it's, you know, applause doesn't work as well for virtual talks. But uh, yeah, uh, thanks, everyone, for coming. And uh, I hope you can join next week. We have uh, Yoichiro Mori. Uh, from University of Pennsylvania.